My name is, is Pete Nato. Uh, Nato is N-A-D-E-A-U. Is it French name? Yeah. So you have a French... Uh, Both sides. One, 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 my mother's side was from Belgium. My father's side was come up from Canada. Canada. What is your birthday? August 19, 1929. That's the year of Great Depression. Yeah. Where were you born? In Centerville, Minnesota. Where? We're in Centerville, Minnesota. Minnesota. About 15 miles north of St. Paul. Mm. And tell me about your family when you were growing up, your fa parents and your siblings. Oh. <laughs> uh, the, the, the worst thing I can say is the, I had four older sisters, and I was eight years old before I ever got a name. They called me the boy. <laughs> and then I had a little brother, so they had to switch and call me something else. But I grew up on a dairy farm, helping with the cows. I didn't especially like the dairy part of it. That ties you down too much. You, you're, you gotta be there every, every morning, every night. You're, too much work? Well, the work isn't that bad. It's just that you're, but why do you have to be every morning there? Well, to milk the cows. Okay. Uh, you have to squeeze the milk? Huh? You have to squeeze the milk? I mean... Well, no, we got milk, uh, electricity about 1940, and we got milking machines shortly afterwards. So about the time I started to milk cows a lot, we had milk. That wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. that, you know, it went pretty fast. It wasn't quite so boring. But what was the bad part of it? Well, the bad, what, what I was just saying, the bad part was I had four older sisters. Why? And, and uh, so I was, oh, when I got in the first grade all the way up, I was, it kind of carried forward. They would, their favorite game was school. They were the teachers. And of course, they were older than me, so I went to first grade and I could do addition and subtraction and could write my name and write stuff, so I had to jump on other kids. And uh, so that was the benefit of it, probably, too. But I, uh, I'm not so smart in some ways. In some ways, I am. I, I, uh, I was picked actually to go back, come back home the second day I was in Korea to go to OCS because of a test score that I got so high on. There. And it, so it was, and I was in a company that platoon that was kind of dysfunctional. Uh, I was. I was in trouble because I was doing things they didn't want me to do. Mm. In in four months, I went up awfully fast. In four months, I was a squad leader. Five months, I was a platoon leader. Six months, I was a, a platoon leader taking an officer's place. So we kind of got rotated back home. So uh, I'd talk a lot with, I'd have to report in, which is it's like a weapons company. It was a 75 recoilless platoon, and until I got to be the squad leader, they fired, I think, about four rounds, and it was always after the battle was over, and it was very discouraging. Within a couple months after I got, we'd usually fire 30 rounds a day with that 75, and sometimes 50. And the battalions would want us to be there because they could see what we could do. But before you continue on that, I want to ask you other question. When did you graduate high school? When? Yeah. 1947. What school was it? St. John's Prep School in Collegeville, Minnesota. And it's a, I'd say, rated about the 
scholastically about the best in Minnesota. Mm. Mm. I, I got F's the first. My mother wanted me to get some religion, go back. So my senior year, I went to St. John's. And I didn't uh, like it. You uh, didn't my, like it? Well, I, I, had, I was in sports and in a bigger public high school. And, and uh, I, it wasn't that I hated it or anything, but it was, uh, I used to come home usually, oh, it's about 70 miles at least every two weeks to help on the farm, to help clean out box stalls and stuff. Uh, so after that, what did you do? Uh, I went to work at Swift and Company in South St. Paul in, in Fort Cut Department. Mm -hmm. And was paid good money. How much? Oh, I started at a dollar two an hour plus bonus money. Dollar two? Yeah. But an that, hour. But that was in 1947. How much? What? What kind of things that you, were you able to buy with one dollar at the time? Mm, didn't smoke at that time. I can uh, trying to think, but. Uh, loaf of bread was 15 cents, 20 cents, or something like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. That was at the beginning of the Second World, the end of the Second World War. Right. So things didn't go up right away. It was after that. And did you know anything about Korea? Did you learn anything about Korea from your high school? I knew where it was. I loved geography. And uh, I knew there was a north and a south, and it had been divided. Beyond that, I was pretty much blank, but uh, I was always interested. So you knew about the location of Korea? Yes. Mm. Very exceptional, because most of the veterans that I did interview, they didn't know where it no. was. So then, when did you leave? When did you join the military? I mean, the I Marine. The Marine Reserve Unit in Minneapolis. A couple of months before the war started. Why? Oh, I got. A, I was was impressed with the Marine Corps. And I thought, well, if something ever happened, I'd have some training and I'd establish. But I had no idea what I was getting into. My oldest sister was a master sergeant in the Marine Corps. Really? Through the Second War, World War, and the Korean War, she went, she was in the reserves, and they called her back. So she was in Korea too? No. 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 And then what happened? Did, how did you come, come to know of the breakout of the Korean War? Where were you in the June 25th? Ooh, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. It was a... I you know, noticed it. You know. So when did you leave for Korea then? Around October or something, yeah. October? Yeah. Toward the end of October. What I, what I, I hadn't gone to boot camp, I didn't go to boot camp. Because you were in the reserve, right? Yeah. Yeah. But they, that was a lot of other people had this were the same situation. Mm -hmm. I was in. But we so I ended up in the first replacement draft. So I actually the day after the division landed at Wonsan, the first replacement draft landed. So you landed in Wonsan? Yeah. And then Oh, it took a, a week. Two weeks, maybe we moved up. Uh -huh. I was uh, usually, it's a regimental company, but I was usually attached to 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, sometimes 1st Marine. But 1st Battalion was uh, sent to Chin Hung Ni. Chin Hung Ni, yes. 
I think the seventh, might have been the fifth Marines were there. But I didn't really know about that, you know, too much. And then, but we were, it's a real little town and it's west of the river and the road and the battalion was all west of the of the river except for the 75 two squads run what is the name of it Udamni? no 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 that's way up north so you were at kodori no well close but up on the hills there wasn't so it was between jinungni and kodori were you yeah, at the jinungni where i where i spent most of my time was at jinungni it was I only see. the last four or five days where we pushed north. So what was your specialty? I, I imagine it was, uh, I had an MOS, I think, of anti-tank. Anti-tank? Yeah. What, what do you mean, imagine? Why do you have to imagine about your MOS? Could you repeat that? What was your MOS? I, I think it was... I don't remember, 301? Yeah, th no, no, not about the number, but what was it? Anti-tank? Anti-tank. Okay. Yeah. So did you work with, uh, did you use the bazooka? No, I, w I was in the Marine Corps Division. First Division was set up. Every regiment had their own anti-tank company. Yeah. In that company, it was a platoon of five tanks and a platoon of 75 recoilers, and I was in the 75 recoilers. Mm -hmm. And I uh, tried to tried to get out, transfer, stay with my friends, and I got rudely told no. And, and pointed a finger at for about two hours that you're never going to get out of this company. <laughs> the next day, I had the pleasure to bring a letter from headquarters Marine Corps to go back to Japan and get a physical work to go to OCS. Go back to what? I was, I was two of us from the 1st Regiment were picked to go back to Japan for physical. And if we wanted, we'd go, to o, go back and go to OCS immediately. Wow, that's a very exceptional, isn't yeah. it? But I, I was kind of taught. I thought it over, but I just had got there, <laughs> and I thought, I want to find out what this is all about. I was a, an aggressive kid, you know. Uh, I wasn't a kid. I was 21. I was, that was one factor. I was an old man compared to somebody 18, yeah. and I had done a lot of things. I was, I was blowing stumps with dynamite when I was 16 years old for a construction company. So did you go to Japan? No. no what I happened? Didn't. What happened? Huh? What happened? Did you Nothing. refuse I, to go? I, yeah, I turned it down. Why? Well, I wanted to find out what combat was like or something. I wanted to see. You know. You were at, crazy. At that, at that time, there was still already talk about the war was over. Who says that? Oh, scuttlebutt. And, and uh, the, after Inchon, and, the, and the, they took back Seoul and went north of the parallel, well, people were saying that the war was going to be, we were going to be home by Christmas. Right. And to go back to OCS, I wasn't sold on a military life, and that meant signing up for six years, I think. So you didn't want to commit? Yeah, so I didn't. So what happened then? You were in G mostly in Jinung Ni, and tell me about what happened in Jinung Ni. Did you encounter with the Chinese? I probably had more encounter with the Chinese than anybody in the battalion, but it wasn't close. I mean, we were up against a bluff, oh, 80 degrees, about a, oh, 200 yards high, and every night they'd come and they'd hang on the rocks with their hand, they'd stick a burp gun over the... Hand grenade? Uh, no, but, but they'd fire with a burp gun. Huh. We were right down below, see. And 
Why didn't you change the location? I don't, I, I don't know. I wanted to go up because it had been simple to get up there quietly and not move and have three, four people coming, moving toward you. You'd have all the advantages. And I got threatened with court martials and everything else. My platoon leader found out about it. And have mentioned it to a corporal that I wouldn't be on guard that night. Take my turn. But uh, so uh, that was ruled out. So instead, we had a light machine gun in our trailer, and I, there was sand under the ice in the river. So I made filled up some sandbags and blocked it up so I could sandbag in a light machine gun. I knew where the rock was. I went up and looked at our tracks, and uh, I knew right where they came. And there's cartridges, empty cartridges around. And uh, so I aimed the machine gun there. And that night when they came and they fired, well, I fired a burst back. And it uh, it bounced off that rock. If it didn't hit them, I don't know if I'd ever hit anybody. But they got discouraged. So that, mm -hmm. Came back the next night, but that was it. They quit. But we weren't hit. The, as far as I know, the whole battalion wasn't really hit until oh, it had to be the 20th or so, 21st, 23rd. I'm not sure. November. How cold was it? It wasn't too bad until. About the 24th or 25th of, of uh, December. December? November? I'm um, November, yeah. And of course, it, was, it stayed pretty cold until. How cold? Can you describe it the way that you uh, felt? The only thing I'd have for a fact was I, I dragged a guy for five hours one night to Mabel Company. And when I got down with them to the road, there was a uh, just a common thermometer in a house, you know, but it had 19 below. And if it was 19 below down there, I figured it had to be 25 below up above. You no, know, I, I couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. But uh, and it was uh, I don't know how how much time you have. That was a. I looked for 50 years for that guy, and nobody in Able Company knew about him. And finally, in San Diego, in I think 2000, there was a reunion, and I I usually stopped talk to people in Able Company. And the, the one one guy said, "Well, I know who you're talking about." And it was a guy, a big guy, two fifteen, two twenty or so, and he was. He'd come to, and he told me he was from Syracuse, but that's all I knew. And he said, yeah, I know just a guy. He's sitting across the room. I went over there and told him, I said, I got a big investment in you. You know, I was kind of half joking and stuff. I said, uh, I spent a lot of time dragging you down a hill. What's his name? I forgot no, and I was How can you him. forget his name? Come oh, on. It's a shame. My I'm, my memory now. Really <laughs> but anyway, the first thing he said when I found him, he was to the side of the hill. Uh -huh. And we were trying to make sure we weren't missing anybody. He was laying in his sleeping bag had it broken the zipper and his hands were half out of the and I touched his hands and it was just like hamburger you took out of the freezer, mm. you know, just froze solid. I thought, oh, you poor guy, you're going to lose your hands. So I put my gloves on him and tried to tuck him in. And there was six of us. I think we went 200 yards carrying them, and four of them, their back hurt, and they, they'll go down and get more help. And I said I wouldn't. I wasn't about to leave him, and there's another guy I'd like to get a hold of that helped me. There were two of us, and we dragged him in, but it took about five hours. 
But anyway, the first thing he said after I introduced myself was, did you get your gloves? <laughs> I, we got them in the uh, pyramid tent, the sick bay, and got them on the stretcher, and he was unconscious. But I went outside, and it hit me. I went 50 feet, maybe. Oh, my hands were... I trapped muskrats in the wintertime and everything else. I knew what cold was pretty well. Uh, ooh, I went back quick and got my... He was in a going to be in a warm place, so I took my gloves back. But somebody, the corpsman or something, when he came to, must have said, some guy picked up your gloves. And, but he, he remembered that. Mm. that what he said. So it was kind of a tearful uh, meeting, anyway, between the two. But he, wife had died, and he moved to Tucson. And he had a daughter in Tucson. Mm. So we talked on the phone. We must have called him four or five times, sent two or three letters. He came to another uh, reunion for a day or so. But his, he had got his almost all the use of one hand, but the other hand was pretty well never did recover. But uh, anyway, it's a, a side note. But no, no, no. It's a I, big part of it. The power of the word. Did you get your gloves? Mm. Just. Yeah, and from Jinungli, you went down to Hungnam to evacuate, right? Yeah, from there. Yeah. Do you remember seeing North Korean refugee there? Well, where we were, we were on the road, and so our unit did the road, kept the road blocked, mm -hmm. and we supposed to inspect, check for weapons and stuff. Most of the refugees were half froze. They finally got a tent with oil stove in it so they could warm up a little bit. You know, some were almost barefoot. They were barefoot uh, at yeah, that December? Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. And carrying kids and trying to carry. It, it was pretty cool. And uh, here I had right away, I'm, wherever I went, I always picked it up good. I had a foxhole with a stove in it. I, Put wood in the stove made out of a big ammunition box for a stove. I remember telling it, there was a guy in a, I assumed it was a husband and a wife. I said, go down and lay there and warm up. I said, you know, it was warm. But it, uh, it was pitiful. It was, it was, you know, they really were suffering. But because of that, hundred. No, hundred thousand North Korean refugee was evac were evacuated, and mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of them came from the area south of the Chosen Reservoir. Yeah, the Chinese they they were scattered. You didn't even see them, but they were scattered houses here and there with little an acre of ground. Here. Well, right away, the Chinese took those houses to stay in them. They were trying to stay alive too. Yeah, and I think that actually cold hurt them more than. That isn't a good statement for me because I could stand the cold pretty well. You know, and I knew how to take care of myself. I spent the last night without a sleeping bag, but I uh, I would have froze to death if I had hadn't stayed. I stayed awake. Yeah, I didn't dare sleep. And, I did freeze my right foot pretty bad. So from you went to Busan and Masan, right? Yeah. And then did you go up to 38 parallel again? Uh, slow. In, I think in January. Oh, yeah. Early in January, we went as far north as Andong. Andong, yeah. It was a kind of a railroad center, I think. But the, the guerrillas... The North Korean remnant would still raid, raid that town, and so we sat up on the hills. Well, then they didn't raid the town anymore, and I think we stayed there. I'd say ten days or so. 
it was on in February, I believe, that we, I think it started at Horn Song. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a push. That first first battalion was uh, being, but there wasn't a lot of resistance compared to, you know. But they were fighting the South Korean army, which wasn't organized. And our regular, our army wasn't organized. So I, mean, I think we went 53 days and we dug two fossils. Well, I mean, I got that backwards. We stayed in the same foxhole two days in, in that 53. We were moving every day. We'd move five miles, four miles, and there wasn't. They'd send a platoon out to take this hill and chase them off of it. When did you leave Korea? November 9th. 1951. So yeah. you stayed there long, even yeah. in 1951. Yeah. Why? Well, I think it, because you they joined. Hit, they hit the year. Year. I think a year. Yeah, that was somebody could take that pretty well. They were. Then where were you in the east side uh, after Hong Song and were you well, at we the? We went up to Chunchan. North, of, we got up along the Huachan. Huachan two. Huachan two. Huachan. Is that a? Yeah, Huachan Reservoir. Yeah. Were there any battle there, when you uh, were there? The heaviest fighting I saw was, oh, just east and north of that reservoir, in May or April, I think. And it's where where. We finally got to work with the infantry, especially on the assault. The 75, they, it was an anti-tank gun, and it was too light for a T-34. But it was you could get up on a hill with it, where you couldn't go with a tank. So that when they run into a bunker, we'd get up close, and we'd blow the bunker, and they'd move up. where they could, couldn't do it with a tank, and uh, so the, from then on we were felt pretty useful. It wasn't uh, the same. And all that time I was a. Uh, we usually have two squads, but I'd be over them, and and uh, instead of a, we didn't have a platoon leader, and it was about. Oh, in August, anyway, I talked to the exec officer of the battalion, in the, bata the commander of the battalion, I can't remember his name, he had a beautiful mustache, but he'd always call me sergeant. One day we were just talking and I said, you know, I'm not meaning any disrespect, but I said, I wish you wouldn't call me sergeant. What's the matter? What's the matter? Are you only a corporal? I said, I'm a PSC, sir. <laughs> he knew I had two corporals under me. And uh, it was about 10 days later, I got a letter from division headquarters that I was a buck sergeant. Oh, big promotion. Yeah, fast. And, and on my records and stuff, it was that I was should be when available, when time permits or something, I forget the wording, I should take the test for a staff sergeant. And, uh, so Have I, you been back to Korea? Yes. When? 2000, I think. Now, i got a friend of mine and talking, and he says it's 1999, but one of those, I'm sure it was 50 years anniversary at Incheon. Mm -hmm. uh, and Till that time, even, I figured what a waste. All the friends I had that got killed, and, and, uh, and for what? But to go back there and see that, it's an eye-opener, you know. Tell me about it. Oh, 
all of those, you know, the industry, everything green. They had, it was all, they had evergreen trees in Korea before, but very few. But they must have planted them about 20 years before seedlings. And they were, ah, uh, Minnesota trees, white pine, red pine. And they were, you know, they were 10 inches, some of them diameter, but just beautiful, all green. It's like Seattle. I don't know if you've gone to Seattle. Yes. You know, but it was the, the roads and the cars and the kids and all dressed up going to school. Every, you know, that they could do that much in 50 years when it was just rubble, nothing. The town of Chunchon, I kind of, always kept in my mind because I stayed with about 18 of us for three days the, the on both sides of it the, the front fell apart and we the, the Marines backed up and they took out the trucks and everything and they left us on the south bank of the of the river right at Chun Chun. We could have only stopped infantry. We didn't have any machine guns. We, we just had small arms. But I, during the day, explored the town. It was all level. But there might have been, I had guessed, 10,000 people at the most in Chun Chun. And when I went back, I hired a guy that gave tours for Korean people to Scandinavia, but he took his own car. He was off one day. I talked to the girl that was on her bus right away to find that up. He drove us back down to Hoang Song and we followed where we went up, and went to Chun Chun. Here's the, everything that was houses and thatched roofs was, had been leveled. This was all set up in blocks. Now it's signal lights on each corner, you know, on five, six-story buildings, and in the valleys where there was, they were growing rice before, that was all high-rise. He, he showed me in an almanac where they estimated the population of Chun Chun to be a million and a quarter people. Oh, I looked at it. <laughs> when you there, boy, there's a lot of people. And they were so close to the DMZ, that's what it kind of, Surprised me too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I came. I changed my mind completely about. You know, I could I could look back and see the people I knew. I had some real good friends that got killed and stuff. And you say, well, boy, that was that was worth it. But, That's about it. That's why I'm doing this. My foundation is to keep your legacy. And people have to know because this is the most successful war U.S. has ever involved since World War II. It is. But we don't teach about it. Yeah. Keep it quiet. Huh? I've, I couldn't for all the, I went, I've got a friend in San Diego that lost most of his jaw in Iwo Jima. He's a relative of my wife. But I, I saw him twice before, and I wanted to see him. So the, we went through the museum. He used to work in it a lot. And I, I could just see how he was almost in tears because they had torn down all the Korean displays, everything. They had a room that was cold. You'd go in there, and you'd feel the cold. You know. And that was all taken in one window with a bazooka inside of it. And I, think, and I think a Chinese prisoner or something. Why is it forgotten then? And why, yeah. Huh? Well, there's a lot of people involved in Vietnam. Even though there wasn't that many more killed in Vietnam, there was a lot of people involved in it. And, and uh, to them, they don't remember Korea. Quite a, quite a few, but 
to forget about the Second World War. That was the, the, the war that really made our country, saved it. But so, so it really hurt to go through that museum and see that all gone. Now Korea is 11th largest economy in the world. Have that. It's the size of Indiana. We don't have a drop of oil. We don't have much natural yeah. resources. But you got more tonnage of shipping built every year. Every year. And we are the substantive democracy in Asia. Mm -hmm. That's the legacy. Yeah. We need to teach about this. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Why we don't teach about this? Yeah. That's why I was so happy to Bob. My daughter came, daughter and my granddaughter, one granddaughter came along. At least she can see a little bit that, hey, you know, there was a war. And there was you were with and your daughter and wife in 2000 in Korea? My wife went with me. Uh -huh. yeah. That's why we are doing this. We, my foundation hosting annual conference for social and history teachers. We had 90 teachers from 25 states in Orlando, Florida this year in June. We're going to have another one next year in Mount Rushmore, South Dakota. Hmm. We're going to invite 200 teachers. If they are qualified and if they show and demonstrate the interest in learning more about the Korean War and post-war Korea development, we cover hotel meals and half of airfare, everything. Would you be interested in spreading this to any teachers in your yeah. region? Yeah, but from Minnesota. You're gonna, you're gonna, I don't have that long. To, uh, I'm in good health, but I mean, I lost my hearing. I lost my my memory. That's the, but I I hurt myself. To, fell in the hole that I dug in the backyard to drain the the roof on the house and stuff, but I do things that I shouldn't be doing. Spread the information in your region to the yeah. teachers. To the teachers. I go okay. to school. Yeah. That, that would be a program that would be good to talk for an hour and have some slides to show them on a screen or something and show them. Yeah. That uh, book, I, I think I've got. Korea that, Revisit? I think I gave away 30 of those books. Korea Reborn? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any teachers in your family? They're all teachers. They are all teachers? I lost a daughter. She was a teacher, too. And, uh, I still got two that are teachers, my, and my son. Talk to them. Is a, but my one son's a master electrician, but the rest are all teachers, all master degrees and teachers. So then they talk to them and ask them to contact me, okay? Yeah. All right? But they're all busy. But, boy. but it's going to be during the summer, yeah. July 11th to 14th in South Dakota, Mount Rushmore. So it's going to be during the break, summer break. And if they qualified, we f cover them almost free, okay? Mm -hmm. The one, my oldest daughter is, is moving the it's uh, working South Dakota, but that, but I, I, it's easy for me to go there. I can get in time as long as I can still drive. So talk to your family member who are teachers, okay, and spread this information. Ask them to contact me, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Any other message you want to leave to this interview? Uh, why I wanted to talk again with the. Chesty Puller story. Tell me about it, please. We were, we had this roadblock, and it was about 10 o'clock, and it had to be a, oh, about the 24th or 25th, maybe, of November. It was about 10 above, but I was, I had a little fire there. Usually there'd be two of us, and I think there was two of us. But I saw a helicopter come over and went around the corner and I could hear him land. And I didn't think much of it, but then I saw three people walking up the road and Puller I had never met, but I 
saw pictures of them, you know, and stuff, so I recognized them right away with a fatigue hat and a kind of a Navy watch jacket on that was open. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he uh, that's just like that cold didn't bother him. But there were two Army officers with him, and I hate to run down the Army because I pitied them. They were, they were so in the F to start with. You know, they, they, they weren't, uh, we took one hill that I remember in Central Korea three times with a platoon or company, and they'd put a regiment on it, and a week later we'd have to go back and take it again. You know, it was, it was, it was but you know, you, you, you uh, I don't know, I could have done anything in their place, you know, better than them. But, but anyway, there was two officers, and I didn't pay much attention to them. And thinking afterward, I imagine the one was Almond. I don't know who the other guy was. So you sure that there was one of them or Almond? I'm not sure, but you know, but I just remember talking. And then of course, as they walked up, you could kind of see the fur ruffling. <laughs> they have been arguing all the way up, you know, about it. But they both had M1s. They both had bandoliers, extra bandoliers hanging on them. Each had two grenades. And here's Fuller with an open shirt, you know, nothing. And they, they wanted to, this one guy with, both had glasses, field glasses, and they were looking for Chinese. And they kept watching directly in front of us and to the north with the, the highest hills. But the terrain was so bad that you, you could never, nobody could get up on, on, on the edge. But anyway, he was looking for, and, and Fuller, you know, asked me, he said, do you ever see Chinese from here? And I said, well, yeah, and across the river, up about three quarters of a mile, that walk on the ridge line. I said, there's usually someone up there walking on it that you can see. So this guy looked over and he said, yeah, there's Chinese. He said, boy, Chet, this is the front line. He said, you better get with him, find yourself a weapon. And Kind of a derogatory. They were both putting each else down. I was, I shut up. I, I figured I'd say. Fuller looked at him and he said, "You just don't get it, do you?" What? What? He said, These guys are Marines. He didn't need insinuating. He didn't need a weapon. He had, he had people there to fight for. They turned around and they. Mm -hmm. Walked the back down. It was down the hill, but spun them down. And Fuller just stood there and shook his head, and looked over me and at me and winked and grinned a little bit, and then he finally followed him. But it was a typical Fuller. He yeah. he'd uh, he'd hurt people's feelings. You know, I heard a pretty factual account of it. But uh, he was all combat, and he didn't want anybody ahead of him. He wanted to be with him. Yep. They had some very good officers in the Korean War at that time, captains and above especially. They had been lieutenants in the island. During the World War II. The, the commander of 1st Battalion, Schmuck, a little guy, energetic, Wanted to always practice fighting at night, do it, do it at night. Uh, but it was always, everything was always organized. So you, you, you know, you, you didn't come off the hill saying, oh boy, we goofed up. And, uh, you had a good feeling. The other story was about, uh, you hear about, the Marines always take out their dead, and and uh, it gets to be a long story. I don't know if you have time for it or not. 
I, I, uh, I was gone from my unit. I went back up the hill after we got the one guy. This Corman said he said that on the radio they talked that out there with somebody else. And I said, so I went back. And it was no small fee to take it, four or five hours for you to go up the hill to climb the hill. And by that time it was almost oh, late in the next day. And Abel Company was getting relieved. They had taken the, the hills and all the bunkers that were shooting could shoot at the bridge. And they were, Charlie Company was going to stay till mid till three in the morning. And I had three, four friends in Charlie Company, people that I knew before the Marines. And uh, but they were always, all they wanted to do was sleep. See? But anyway, I, so I had to all stay with you till three o'clock and go, go down with you. It, there wasn't any uh, worrying about patrols or having Chinese. There was no pressure, but you never know for sure. You know, no mm -hmm. Anyway, we got in an argument. Oh, and I said I'd, I hadn't slept for, for three, this was the third night in a row I hadn't slept. I didn't have a sleeping bag. You know, it wasn't always moving all the time. And uh, I went through there twice the night before and they were all sleeping. I, want, I woke them up to try to see them. Boy, the one guy almost shot me down. I woke them up. I wanted to see if my buddies were still okay. But anyway, I said I'll stay awake the first hour. And then from now, they, it was like they didn't even, how were they going to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning if they didn't keep somebody on watch? I was, I was just so frustrated with them. And I went to sleep, and I, I think in 15 minutes I woke up, and the guy that I was going to be on the watch was snoring away. <laughs> I got up, and I knocked them over, and they all just about jumped on me. I thought I was going to have a big battle. But I, I said, you know, you, you don't have able company even in front of you anymore. I said, you don't know what's going to happen. And anyway, I said, finally said, the hell with a bunch of you. I said, I'll, I'll stay awake myself. I want to get out of here. And so I woke them up at 3, and by 9 o'clock, we got down to the road. It was a long William. The guy that was kind of the, a platoon sergeant or something over him come over and asked me what what time was it? And I said, oh, about 9.30. He said, well, what time is it? He said, I want to. And I said, I don't know. I said, he said, well, look at your goddamn watch. And I said, my watch broke two weeks ago. I said, I don't have a watch. Well, how did you know it was three o'clock? He was, he was just, I thought he was going to shoot me. He was just mad. I said, look at the stars. I can tell time by the stars. And within 10 minutes or 15 minutes, or, and I don't think he ever believed me. He said, oh, well, you know, I'll look at the stars now. I said, it's cloudy now and it's daytime now. I can't see the stars. But it, but it was. The fact that he couldn't understand that, you'd think that every, at least the, with a rank of sergeant in the Marine Corps, would know how to tell time by the stars. See, I grew up, I knew I'd go in a department store up and down and here and back, and I'd still, there's north, you know. But that's kind of a gift, too. But, uh, but at least he should be able to know that you can tell the time by the stars. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and then shortly after I got back to my unit, of course, my I was always at odds with the squad leader. He was a hillbilly from Oklahoma. And we never got along from the day one. 
So he, he started to jump on me, where was I? And he was gonna run me up, boy, for desertion and, and the combat zone. I kind of cooled him off a little bit. So we walked, we were the tail end of the convoy and we went about a mile and up ahead of us, the Chinese broke the convoy. So the rather people started to go up there to help them and they passed the word back, stay where you are, we'll take care of it. They, and I was sitting there and I was so tired, I couldn't think even. Here was an army truck on the side of the road and I, when I looked at it, that couple tires were shot out. It had keys were in it, full tank of gas, 400 miles, but it went dark. And of course, my background, I said, yes. I got out my knife and started looking at the points. And I said, what's wrong? Why, why don't it start? And the points were how they could have a vehicle with the points that far out of adjustment, I don't know. So I just use a feeler gauge, you know, a thousandth of an inch is a lot. And, but I did by eye, and it started at once spark plug was, had been hit with a bullet, so it ran maybe on three cylinders. And we really had a hard time getting one wheel off, so not was really rusted on. We got, behind us was a half track, an army half track and a light tank with 20, 40 millimeters on it. So that we got wrenches from them to change the tires. There were a lot of tires. And, but we could only go about 15 miles an hour with the truck. But they said, well, that's fine. We'll stay with you. We started up. In the meantime, the convoy had gone walking. We went around the corner and we never, about two miles down, they had all been picked up from the truck. So <laughs> here we were with just with the and of course the Chinese were mostly on the west side, but of course they'd shoot at that truck. But we picked up dead bodies along the way. I think it was the town of Sudong. I, I yeah. think it what happened the night before. They really broke the, the line for a while. And this guy went off the road with his truck, but he got his arms in the steering wheel and I couldn't get him out. Tried to pull him and found out afterwards and should have taken the butt of my rifle and broke his arm. And could have got him out and thrown him on the truck. And we throw him in the back of the truck. But I was, I always felt bad about it because their his parents or something would have known he came home and we had to leave him there. But that's about. It. Actually. As far as the combat reservoir, I didn't see that much. I got a metal a lot of, but uh, yeah. But what you saw in Korea, 1950 and 51, and the 2000 that you saw is a uh, that is your legacy. That is oh. the so that means that your suffering, miserable situation that you had to suffer never been wasted and the Korean people now very proud of what they have achieved yeah. because you fought for us. Yeah. So Pete, help us to educate our teachers. Teachers has to know about this. Teachers have to know about this and that's why we are doing this and help us, okay? Yeah. All right. I would say I should, I don't know if there's a a supply of those books about Korea revisited, but boy, if I got another 30 of them, mm -hmm. there's schools, local schools. Talk to teachers and ask them to contact us, okay? Okay. Yep. Peter, thank you so much for your story and your service, and this is going to be edited and will be uploaded into internet, and we'll let you know, okay? okay. All right. Yeah.